Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this session of the Science of Climate Solutions with the Delaware County Institute of Science. My name is Laura Gurton. I'm a volunteer with the Delaware County Institute of Science in Media, Pennsylvania. I'm also a professor of earth science at Penn State Brandywine. And I want to welcome you to our final session. Before we take a break for the summer, we have been each month looking at the various sectors uh, with Project Drawdown and looking at different solutions towards what's going on with climate science. And I will quickly uh, just give a shout out to the quilt that's next to me. For those of you that have been returning week, month after month, uh, I've been displaying a different quilt I have made relating to each of the drawdown sectors. So if you want a sneak peek at the rest of the quilts that match to different climate solutions, there's a URL at the bottom here. Bit bit.ly slash drawing down tour that'll give you a virtual museum tour <laughs> of these quilts one way again that we can use to communicate science not just through lectures we can also use art as well and because we are talking about drawdown i do want to take a moment and actually share my screen because there were some questions on the registration form asking about again what is project drawdown so project drawdown is a nonprofit organization that researches they look for ways that we can actually address the increase that we're seeing in greenhouse gases and what are the efforts that we can take to actually reverse those carbon dioxide emissions what are the different pathways what are the different uh, suggestions for how we can move towards that and so underneath if we're and we're on the main page drawdown.org you can see that there are various sectors that are here and so each month we've been having a webinar relating to the various sectors so we had started with an overview with matt scott from project drawdown who introduced us uh, to the entire program then we uh, looked at the electricity sector we looked at food agriculture and land use last month and then for this evening's lecture we are looking at the industry sector and so when we look at the industry sector, what does that mean? That might be a, a, something that doesn't sound very exciting, but it is so important for what's going on. And I'll just scroll down a little bit here in the industry sector. And there's a question on this page. How can we improve industrial processes and materials produced? How can industry make use of waste and move forward flows of substances that are efficient and circular? This is incredibly important when we think about how much we produce and maybe how we can repurpose or reduce all of that uh, to, again, address what's going on with emissions. And so within Project Drawdown, these are not uh, a finite set of solutions, but these are just different uh, categories, different areas of research. You see here composting, bioplastics, alternative cement, methane digesters. Again, not an exhaustive list, but you'll be hearing about work done in some of these units this evening. So I'm going to stop my sharing and I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first presenter. We have two presenters this evening. I am thrilled for us to have AJ Tabzulu. Oh, I'm sorry, AJ Tabzulu. Uh, she is at uh, the Janssen Pharmaceutical Companies of Johnson & Johnson, and she's going to give us a little bit more about her background in biochemistry and how that actually relates to what she's doing with biology and plastics. So AJ, I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's it's great talking about some of the science that I did over the past few years. And it's always fun to talk about, you know, uh, one's PhD research, even though right now I'm in um, Janssen R&D. My PhD was focused on degradation of plastics using biological sources. So today I'm going to give a brief um, talk about what I did for my PhD and how that relates to uh, some of the industry work that is going on. So I'm going to start sharing my screen. Um, hopefully you guys can see my screen now. Great. Um, so the uh, the focus of my PhD was on what I like to call uh, plastic eaters. What we were trying to do at uh, my my um, my previous place of work, NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, um, we were trying to engineer microorganisms and enzymes to help solve plastics problem. Um, I got my PhD in Montana State University um, in Bozeman, Montana, and but my um, 
work was mostly done in NREL, National Renewable Energy Laboratory, located in Golden, Colorado, which is not a far, uh, which is not far away from Bozeman. Um, and as we all know, plastics do have a high environmental cost. Um, amount of plastic that is recycled is really, really low. We produced more plastic in the 21st century than the 20th century all combined. Uh, truckload of plastic waste enters into the ocean every second. And all of these issues highlight something that is very, very important. We need sustainable solutions to address the plastics production problem. And uh, on top of the plastics pro production problem that we have, microplastics issues getting worse. What well, we have uh, a microplastic pieces that are in our drinking water, in our food, and even in the air. We eat, drink, and inhale microplastics constantly. And it's been shown to be toxic to marine animals, and there's a good chance that it is harmful for us. Um, and one of the main culprits of this problem is PET, polyethylene terephthalate. It's one of the most abundant plastics out there, and it's based uh, and it's made out of petroleum sources. So that's one issue with most of the plastic products that we have. We, they are derived from petroleum resources, and then we just put them back into the environment where they don't get into any sort of a cycle where they can be regenerated. So because of this, um, we have yet another issue in our hands. And we do use recycling methods, um, but the recycling methods that we use today are not enough to um, get rid of the plastics that are accumulating in the landfills. For instance, 80% um, of the, so 80% is a very, very, um, is a very uh, optimistic number. 80% of the plastics that we produce uh, end up in the landfill. Say the 20% of this is recycled, half of it go to probably bur uh, burning trash and then the other half actually gets recycled. But when it gets recycled, it goes through this process called mechanical recycling, meaning that we heat up the plastic and then remold it and then while we're doing this, we are losing some of the material properties of these plastics. So in the end, uh, you can you cannot recycle, for instance, a plastic bottle more than twice. So that's not actually recycling. In the end, everything goes to uh, landfill regardless. And this happens with pretty much uh, every other plastic that we have, not just PET. Um, and mechanical recycling, therefore, is unsustainable. It might be cheap. And it, it, in the end, we might feel a little happier about recycling things, but it's not going to uh, it's not going to help us actually create what we call a circular materials economy. So instead of mechanically recycling plastics, what we would like to do uh, industrially is to chemically recycle. And chemical recycling can be sustainable. What we can do is we can start recycling our plastic, and then we can not mechanically break them down, not heat it up, but use chemical processes to break down the plastic into their building blocks and then refeed it into a production line and either make more plastics with it or uh, somehow start a process of energy recovery so if, if we can sustainably recycle them and then feed it into our energy uh, grid. And so these are two ways that we can use plastics to um, integrate into circular economy. And the idea of circular economy is slowly becoming a little bit more uh, popular in, uh, in the United States. Europe has already taken uh, significant steps towards making circular economy a reality. Um, America is falling behind a little bit, but the research is here and we're slowly moving towards it. And I know that for a fact that California is probably spearheading um, this movement in the United States. Now, one way that we can, um, that I was looking at to um, use plastics in the circular materials economy is to chemically break down PET bottles, uh, polyethylene terephthalate bottles. Um, and, and we were inspired um, by a group of Japanese scientists in 2016 um, that, that found an enzyme that was capable of breaking down pet bottles. 
And this is a very generalized way of saying that they were using plastics to grow. And in order for something to be able to use plastics to grow, they need to have certain enzymes or certain molecular machinery in uh, these microorganisms in order for them to be able to uh, succeed in growing on pet bottles. So the scientists uh, from Japan identified that this microorganism, Idionella secaiensis, uses an enzyme called petase to break things down. And while I'm not going to get into the details of what's happening in this figure, the general idea is that this microorganism um, sticks to the surface of a pet bottle. And then that microorganism releases a prod, a, an enzyme called petase, which we depict with these nice little diagrams. And petase then starts chopping away at the pet bottle, breaks it down into its smaller products. And then a secondary enzyme comes in and eats it more. Then the product of that gets uh, get, uh, taken up by the cell. And then those products are used to uh, generate energy and growth for the microorganism. So if we can isolate that enzyme petase and somehow try to industrially scale it up, we can use it to recycle pet bottles a little bit more sustainably because whatever building blocks that pet ace will break the pet bottle into those things are indeed uh the materials which we make pet bottles from so we can actually come full circle so um in this uh in this video here you see a very very blurry picture of pet ace actually eating away at a pet bottle, a green pet bottle in about two weeks or so. And this was before we were able to engineer uh, this particular enzyme for industrial applications. So um, we learned a lot of things about petase. We've learned that, that this, um, this red circle here is where all the chemistry of breaking down pet takes place. And we've also learned that in nature, we've identified proteins or enzymes similar to petase. Um, there was a fungus, for instance, uh, that has an enzyme very similar to petase. And we kind of used this um, enzyme to model our own petase to make petase a little bit more efficient, well, a little less efficient because we were just trying to test the theory. So we said, if petase is better, then this particular protein, if we make our protein similar to this, then we would have reduced activity. But when we engineered this particular enzyme to completely destroy it, it surprised us. And we accidentally ended up making this enzyme better. So the way that I set up these experiments was I just had a tiny little pet coupon. I put it in a plastic tube that was not the kind of plastic that enzyme was able to digest. But when I um, incubate or you know put together the coupon and enzyme together, I saw that without enzyme, um, I get no reaction. But then with the enzyme, I get a lot of reaction. And then with the mutant that we engineered, we have even better uh, degradation efficiency. And we can actually look at this under a microscope. So under a microscope, we can look at a uh, plastic coupon that has absolutely no enzyme treatment. And then we can look at a plastic coupon that has a little bit of an enzyme treatment. And then we can look at the plastic coupon that has treatment by the mutant, which is the better pet, uh, which is the better petase. And from all of this, we see that mutant performs much better than our um, than our plast than our initial enzyme. And this made us really hopeful because it means that we can engineer this enzyme to be better, so that we can make it more efficient, and that would help us with industrial scaling. Um, we know that the mutant is better because you know we measure mass loss, we measure product release, etc. And I don't want to bore you with you know. Uh, figures here, but what I want to show you is that if we have the secondary enzyme, um, petase and metase together, we can achieve even uh, better efficiency. So again, we have no enzyme here. And then the secondary enzyme that I was talking about 
by itself, it doesn't do anything. But when it works with PETES, it um, degrades plastic a lot better. So we can do various uh, enzyme cocktails to indeed uh, make the plastic degradation process a lot more efficient. And all of this research basically helped um, uh, 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 helped researchers achieve industrial scalability. Now, uh, we tried to make a better metase or the secondary enzyme as well, but we didn't really get too much into detail for it because we wanted to like focus a little bit more on petase itself. But essentially, all of this uh, can be used in an industrial context. So uh, in France, there is a, a company called Carbios, which has effectively taken a, a, a plastic bottle and it degraded it with a petase-like enzyme that they engineered. The broken down products were then efficiently recycled back into um, the plastic, virgin-like plastic bottles. And this is a huge step in moving towards an economy where everything is uh, operating in a circular materials fashion, meaning that nothing is going to waste. And that is, I think um, this is a very, very small step. Like when I first uh, defended my dissertation re related to this, uh, I had a lot of questions, people asking me, so how long is it gonna be till this thing is actually scalable? And I would always, you know, I would always refrain from making such certain statements. I could, I would say things like, oh, you know, in a couple of years, it's going to happen. And I defended my dissertation in 2019. Now, it's 2021 June. We had about a year of this pandemic that hindered a lot of progress with respect to this particular project. But um, in, in, in about two years, we were able to achieve um, complete recycling of a pet product back into a pet bottle. And that is really, really hopeful. That means that we can actually start using post-consumer pet products for industrial applicability. And that, that is really, really exciting for me. Now, I know I ran through all of this, but if there is any questions that um, you'd like to ask me, I'd be more than happy to answer. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, AJ, for that presentation. There is a lot in there. And I do encourage people that are logged in to go ahead, type your questions into the chat. We're going to give Jay Regan a chance to present first on something that is related but different. So, <laughs> so Jay is a professor of environmental engineering um, in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Penn State University, the University Park Campus in State College, Pennsylvania. And again, please go ahead, put your questions in the chat. And after uh, Jay takes us through his research, uh, we'll, we'll start going through that and have a discussion. So Jay, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Laura. Okay, well, thank you all for, uh, for attending and for your attention. I'm trying to get in presentation, okay. Um, so I, as uh, Laura introduced, uh, I'm gonna talk about um, some of the work that I'm doing in this industrial sector of the concept of drawdown. And uh, just to give an overview of, of my research at large, I work in um, the broad area of environmental biotechnology. I study microbes. Um, I use microbes for waste treatment, kind of some of what um, AJ talked about there. And uh, specifically, I look at um, a perspective of recovering energy from waste, recovering or removing nutrients from waste. And I also study microbes in natural ecosystems like soils, streams, wetlands, primarily with respect to um, how they remove or retain phosphorus and nitrogen in the landscape. And I also, a fair amount of my work is looking at trying to recover novel microbes. It's a field called bioprospecting. So I get to go to neat places like Yellowstone National Park, um, Northern Chile, and, and a sample from extreme environments to try to retrieve um, novel microbes that can do some of the things that I'll, I'll talk to you about here tonight. Um, and Laura showed this in her overview of, of uh, this is from the drawdown organization's website. And I, I just wanted to show there's lots of different aspects to the concept of drawdown, getting to um, negative or, or carbon reductions. And so I kind of highlighted 
the parts of this uh, that intersect with my work. So tonight we're talking about industry um, and then there's a lot of overlap among all of these different sectors, but, but I kind of look in the um, electricity production using microbes, using uh, agricultural products, biomass, and even using land sinks. And so I'll talk a little bit about some of those um, in an industry context here tonight. Uh, this is a figure that uh, was, was uh, presented a, a few years ago in a publication. There's a lot going on here, and I, uh, there's a lot superimposed on this figure, but the key points I want to show here are, um, this is CO2 emissions over time, and the idea of drawdown that, that Laura talked about is actually not just reducing our carbon emissions, but actually lowering the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that requires eventually getting to negative carbon dioxide emissions to lower it. And so what this shows is kind of the Paris climate agreement here is 2015. This solid black line shows net emissions. So that would be produced minus um, sequester or, or negative emissions. And, and the projection here in this model shows reaching drawdown at around 2070 or so. And so to do this really is going to require reducing our emissions. But more than that, it, if we're going to actually reduce CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, we actually need processes that sequester or, or have negative carbon emissions. And so I'm going to talk about some ways that we can do that in the, in the space that I work in, which is kind of waste treatment, bioenergy production. I'll start with this idea of reducing emissions, replacing fossil fuels uh, for, for, for uh, energy and for, for products. And then I'll talk just a slide or two on, on how could we actually get negative emissions from these processes. So uh, one way to get um, reduced emissions is, is to kind of wean ourselves off of fossil fuels by thinking of wastes as resources and, and not wastes. And so this is occurring in a lot of different areas. One of them that I work in is in the uh, wastewater treatment industry. In fact, there's a, a movement to stop saying wastewater treatment plants and to talk about water resource and re recovery facilities. And so uh, about 10 years ago or so, the, the, one of the main industry um, representatives or professional organizations came out with a fact sheet on how do we get net zero energy in wastewater treatment plants. And one of the statements they make in that is that the energy contained in wastewater and biosolids, so this is talking about municipal wastewaters here, it exceeds the energy needed for treatment by about tenfold. So we use about two or three percent of our electricity demand in this country just for water and wastewater treatment and conveyance. A lot of that's pumping. A lot of that is energy spent on aeration to run aerobic processes. And there's about 10 times more energy in the waste than um, we use to, to treat it. And so the idea is how do we invert our paradigm and actually extract energy instead of spending lots of energy while still getting waste treatment. And so that energy is in, in different forms. It's There's thermal energy, there's hydraulic energy, so pumping and um, elevation differences of, of waters. And then a lot of it is in chemical energy. That's where my work comes in is how do we take the waste organic materials and instead of spending energy to treat them, how do we extract energy in that treatment process? And so one of the ways that my group is looking at this is using um, anaerobic digestion. And that is basically using a consortium of microbes, lots of different microbes, to break down organic material and produce what we call biogas. Biogas is just a methane carbon dioxide mixture. Usually it's something like 50 to 60% methane. The balance is CO2. And so we can do this. This is a farm digester here, a dairy farm. We can do this with municipal solids. We can do this with manures. We can do this with cellulosic materials like corn stover and switchgrass. And so we have a project with the Department of Energy now trying to study the optimization of this process at different temperatures, different pHs, different retention times, looking at the microbes and what they're doing and um, how we can get them to do those things better. Um, 
This is a figure that I took from a, a group uh, headquartered in Italy where the, it, it's a nice graphic that shows the integration of anaerobic digestion, which is here, with kind of a systems wide thinking. So putting wastes into anaerobic digesters, these are animal waste, these are crop residues or, or even bioenergy crops, things like switchgrass grown deliberately for energy production. We use the microbes to break them down into methane and CO2, this biogas product. And then um, we can produce electricity from that, that biogas. So that's what this is showing. We can also um, remove the CO2, purify it uh, to, to make renewable natural gas that would substitute fossil fuel based natural gas um, in, in the grid. So we call that biomethane here. And then the, the liquid slurry that is the product of this, which we call digestate, that could be used as a fertilizer to, to kind of feed back into this cycle. So this is an idea of, of anaerobic digestion incorporated into a system to, to try to um, produce bioenergy and also bioproducts um, in place of, of, um, in place of uh, fossil fuel derived energy sources. Another technology that, that my group works on and, and several others here at, at Penn State are working on is something called bioelectrochemical systems. And I know there's a lot going on in this figure, but, but the, the simple idea of this is there are microbes that can use electrodes as their electron acceptors, the way that you and I use oxygen. We respire oxygen. Some microbes can dump electrons onto an electrode and we can collect those electrons and produce electricity from that process. And so if this uh, feed is say wastewater, uh, we can treat the wastewater and produce a little bit of electricity in the process there. And so these are called bioelectrochemical systems. There's also microbes not shown in this figure that can take electrons from the cathode of this system here too. So these systems are kind of an emerging technology. Um, there are a few um, companies that are commercializing them now, but, um, but definitely they are in the um, kind of scale up and product development stage. But what I wanna show here is just, there's lots of potential applications for these bioelectrochemical systems. Waste treatment I talked about, this is a system in uh, Queensland, Australia at the Foster's Brewery there. Um, the, the Navy is using these as they deploy these out into um, ocean sediments and they can use them to be kind of um, deep sea battery replacements. So they can do oceanographic monitoring without using batteries, without needing divers. They just use microbes eating the organics that are in um, ocean sediments producing electricity. We can do all sorts of things at the cathode, um, remediating uranium contamination, nitrate contamination. We can even use some microbes can take electrons from a cathode and fix carbon dioxide to make bioproducts like acetate, like butanol, butyrate. And so we could, we could um, use these systems if we had a, say a solar panel delivering renewable electricity, uh, we could actually use microbes to fix carbon and make reduced products in these systems. And then another area, there's, there's a lot that I'm not showing here, but another area is using these systems to desalinate water. And so if you, if you use the microbes to produce an electrical current, like I talked about, there's also an ionic current that establishes in here. And you, if you have the right selection of membranes, you can desalinate water driven not by something like reverse osmosis, but driven by the activity of these microbes. There's lots of different potential applications of these bioelectrochemical systems. And uh, so I've talked about kind of how do we lower our carbon emissions using technologies, anaerobic technologies like anaerobic digestion, biological, uh, bioelectrochemical systems. That doesn't really get at the issue of how do we actually have negative emissions? How do we, how do we move to draw down with negative emissions? And so this figure also has a lot going on. I just wanna highlight the key point that I'm trying to make here is um, the, the, what this figure is showing is um, carbon. This is a carbon scale. 
NPP is net primary productivity. So this is um, land management strategies that deliberately produce biofuel um, resources like switchgrass and uh, miscanthus and, and, and other um, uh, bio, bio products that we can use for biofuel production. Some of the carbon that is um, uh, involved in that net, net primary productivity gets respired by microbes in the soil and released back to the atmosphere. That's this one. Uh, but some can be used for uh, fuel production. And so that's what this arrow is showing. So this, this gray arrow is the um, um, basically the fossil fuel equivalent. So the displaced fossil fuel use due to producing fuels from, um, from biomass material. And then this last arrow here is what I want to show is this is actually carbon um, storage. So carbon capture and storage. So this sequestration part here. And so this could actually contribute to um, negative carbon emissions as these plants um, have lots of their, their mass is actually in the subsurface in the roots and they actually store carbon, removing it from the atmosphere. So, so this is one way that we could potentially move into a negative um, carbon um, scenario, a drawdown scenario. And so this shows just uh, kind of the, the, a graphic of, of the possibilities here, collecting biomass from a variety of resources, municipal solid waste is part of that, but also algae, um, crop residues, tree products, and producing not only energy, but, but other products that we currently um, derive from fossil fuels, maybe the, the plastic materials that um, AJ talked about. There's, there's groups looking at converting biomass derived carbon into uh, plastic precursors and plastic products. And so, so this would be kind of moving in the direction of negative emissions and, and carbon drawdown. So thanks for your attention. And uh, I will stop sharing here and, and hopefully um, have an opportunity to answer some questions here. And thank you for that, Jade. We definitely have questions coming in the chat. I have some that have been emailed to me and we have some that came in on the registration form. So <laughs> what I'd like to do first though, I've, I've done this with each month's session. I think it's kind of fun. I know I've served on panels before where I've listened to other panelists and I have questions that I wish I could ask them. So I thought I would give each of you a chance to start with to see if AJ, you have any questions for Jay, you would like to ask him. And the same for you, Jay, if you have any specific questions you'd like to follow up with AJ on. Um, nothing yet. I guess I guess I'll I'll have to think a little bit more about it before anything. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess, AJ, I don't know if any of your work has gotten into, I, I alluded at the very end about these, you know, bio, bio derived plastic precursors and products. Do you do any work in that space or? or um, I you? actually, I, I, we, we've looked into a little bit, I was gonna, I was gonna be a part of that project, but um, during the pandemic, obviously, things, things have changed a little bit. But one of the, uh, interesting enough, one of the projects that I was, you know, first starting with was engineering of organisms, especially Pseudomonas uh, uh, putida, to, um, to produce bio-derived plastics from sources like glucose. So just by using glucose, we can make uh, what, we, what my group has called performance advantaged materials to okay. uh, uh, materials that are really similar to, um, to you know, things like polyethylene terephthalate or nylon 6-6, which is used in, you know, it's just used to make Kevlar or adipic acid, uh, beta keto adipate, which are like precursors to like really, really important industrially uh, applicable materials. Or um, we also looked at using carbon sources only to um, make chemicals that can be used as uh, additives in solar and wind panels and stuff like that. 
so there was a lot of like there's a lot of research that my previous group has done on that for sure and I, I'm sure his name has come across uh, in your studies his name is Dr. Greg Beckham and he oh, has yeah. done a, <laughs> he has yeah he, I've, I've worked with him and he has done a lot of work under uh, for you know uh, for generation of um, materials from reusable sources yeah a lignin drag thanks so. Exactly, lignin derivation and uh, basically any cellobios based uh, material. Okay, thanks. Okay, we, uh, let's go ahead and start going through some of the questions that have come in. So uh, I'll start with the first one here in the chat. What happens when you recycle an already recycled plastic item based on the point of not being able to recycle plastic more than once? That's a that's a great question. So that's where the problem of plastics recycling comes in. Um, we're not when we're recycling plastic. What we do is we take it to a recycling facility. In that recycling facility, the plastic gets sorted by what kind of plastic it is. You know, not all plastics are the same, um, and they are sorted by their density, by their properties, etc. And after they're sorted um, according to what they are, they're heated up. When we heat them up. Uh, and then cool them back down, we lose what we call material properties. So for polyethylene terephthalate, PET, one desirable property is gas barrier properties. So gas barrier property is how much uh, gas within it's able to contain. So if you're making a Coke bottle, for instance, you want that Coke bottle to not leak any of the carbon dioxide that is in the Coke because um, that's one of the reasons why Coke is so bubbly, right? So if you recycle a PET bottle um, mechanically, you won't be able to use it as a bottle again. So you're use, losing, for instance, that gas barrier property. And that's not a desirable thing, right? So that's why we say we cannot recycle it um, for a second time, because when we recycle a plastic bottle, we can't use it for, we can't use it again as a plastic bottle. What we can use it for is something like a carpet or, or carpet fibers or like clothing. So that's why I, I that's why I, uh, I use the term, you can't recycle it again, or, you know, uh, we, well, that's why I say that recycling plastics is not entirely sustainable. Thank you. And I'll jump to a question for Jay. Uh, you had shown an image that talked about um, using waste from farms and from animals. But we have a question, why isn't human waste included in the cycle that you showed? Um, if you're talking about that kind of system-wide figure that I showed, um, I didn't generate that figure. If I had, I definitely would have had human waste generating or feeding into the digester too. Um, so that was showing um, manures and crop residues. Um, typically with anaerobic digestion, uh, or I should say conventionally, it has been used for the treatment of sludges produced in wastewater treatment. So oftentimes we have a, an aerobic process for treatment. We generate this sludge material and that is fed into a, a digester. Um, but there are a lot of groups looking at using digestion on municipal wastewater is very dilute compared to sludge and manures. And so there are groups looking at um, making it work effectively on those dilute streams. So there's a lot going on in, in that process, but you know, one alternative is to not use as much dilution water as well. So, um, so that um, if we had more decentralized waste treatment facilities, we wouldn't need as much conveyance water <clears throat> and these anaerobic digestion systems would work better. But um, certainly it is for human waste too. That, that figure, I'm not sure why they didn't have an arrow going from the people up to the digester, but um, I would put an arrow in there. Yeah, thank you. And Jay, maybe I could follow up. This is a, a popular question we usually get. How did you end up doing this as a career? Because I'm sure when you were younger, you did not say, when I grow up, I want to work with... <laughs> And, and this field probably wasn't really there at the time you were going through school. I have a feeling this is much uh, more recent development with science. So could you just talk a little bit about your career trajectory and, sure. and what interests and drives you in working in this area? 
Sure. Um, anaerobic digestion was definitely a mature field when I was going to school. Um, bioelectrochemical systems, that second technology I talked about, that's a much more recent thing that's maybe 20 years old now. Um, but I, I actually wanted to be a farmer as a kid. I worked on a chicken farm and I, I wanted to be a farmer. And I went to school as an agricultural engineer. That's my undergraduate degree. And in that space, which is pretty diverse, there's power and machinery and water and waste. But I was kind of drawn to the, the environmental side of that, the, um, the idea of taking wastes and treating them to make clean water. So that was kind of my driver. It, it, I don't know how weird that makes me, but I, I, I was motivated by <clears throat> getting into a field that involved producing clean water. And, um, and so that was water treatment and wastewater treatment. And then um, maybe the past 20 years or so, it's kind of moved into extracting energy in that process. So not just accomplishing the waste treatment goal, but exploiting the fact that those wastes have lots of energy in them. So um, the idea of energy neutral waste treatment, that would have huge global implications, you know, in, in countries that um, aren't able to or aren't going to um, do the infrastructure that, that we have that's very energy intensive. If they could just break even with their waste treatment with, with uh, simple decentralized systems, that would be a huge global sanitation accomplishment. So, so that's kind of what motivated me to, to get into this, the idea of producing clean water. Your description just makes it sound so exciting, which is wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My kids don't think so, but yeah. <laughs> AJ, do you mind giving us your story and your journey into your work? Um, yeah, of course. Uh, I, I'm from Istanbul, Turkey, originally. I was born and raised there, and I went to, when, when I, I, I come from, I come from a, family that are not scientists but my mother was a science teacher and my love for chemistry kind of you know grew with her and I went into chemical and biological engineering in my undergraduate and I uh, I was in Istanbul Technical University and one day I find myself in Montana State University doing an exchange program totally my last choice but um <laughs> I realized that Montana was beautiful and a lot of the environmental science that was happening in uh, uh, Montana State University and the, the kinds of discoveries that were being done in Yellowstone National, National Park was just really exciting for me. So I decided to move towards environmental biochemistry myself. And it, it was the love for, you know, the mountains and the beauty around me after going from a city of, you know, 15 million people that kind of helped me understand that I need to be doing science that is related to helping the environment. And that's why I went into um, environmental biochemistry. Your passions are so similar that <laughs> different journeys, but still have the, the same end goal in a way. So that's wonderful. Uh, AJ, if I could ask you one of the other questions from the chat here, what would happen if you put the enzymes, the pedase and metase in the ocean? Um, in, in small concentrations, I don't think pedase and metase would be too effective in helping us addressing any sort of plastics problem. We would need to put a lot of pedase and metase in the ocean, but say that we can. Um, I think in the end, I'd, I wouldn't I wouldn't think that it would be a sustainable option because the building blocks of, of PET um, is ethylene glycol and what we call a, and another chemical that we call terephthalic acid. And these could be very, very toxic really quickly to a lot of organisms. So what we would need to do is uh, engineer organisms. That's why microbial engineering is very, very important. We wanna engineer organisms not only that, that can not only degrade these uh, plastics, but we want to be able to make sure that the um, that the degradation products are not toxic to anything else. So there's a, a lot of um, work that's being done on this, but the most recent one that I know of, they recently engineered a an organism to create biofilms on the sediments of the ocean, which can effectively uh, capture microplastics in the ocean 
and then they use uh, this this uh, net-like structure that they make themselves to keep all the microplastics and the degradation products in the biofilm itself. And then we can take out the biofilm created uh, created biofilm and then separate the degradation products and microplastics from the ocean that way. So instead of just putting the enzymes in the ocean, what we want to do is engineer microbes that can trap the plastic, trap the degradation products, and then we take the degradation products from the microbes. Thank you for that. And since it is National Ocean Month, we'll ask one more ocean question that came in. Jay, this one's for you. How do carbon sequestration rates for biomass compare to carbon sequestration deep underground and in the deep ocean? I don't know. I don't know those numbers. Um, they're not mutually exclusive things. I'll, I'll say that when we talk about, um, I, I, in that graphic, that farm graphic that I didn't produce, um, they had uh, biogas production and they had renewable natural gas being sent back into the natural gas grid. That requires CO2 removal from biogas and something has to be done with that CO2. So. So they are interconnected to some extent, but I, I'm sorry, I, I don't know the comparison of the rates for what we call bioenergy, carbon capture and storage versus the other things you mentioned here, the ocean and underground. I'll need to look into that. I should know those numbers. Well, I know certainly within Project Drawdown, the, they break, they categorize their uh, solution sectors by sources and by sinks and, and the sinks, they say there's so much more modeling that needs to be done that that's mm. a, an area that we still have a lot to learn that we haven't studied as well. Yeah, for sure that's true in the area I work, which is kind of the uh, plant-based sequestration. There's a lot of questions still about um, how permanent that is, how much of it gets respired, reoxidized, you know, how, how reliable is that for storage? And that's true of the others as well. The, the deep underground injections and things is the permanency. So yeah, I, I thank you for rescuing me with that part, but <laughs> <laughs> we, need, we need to study that more. Plenty of science to do, that's for sure. Yeah. So the Delaware County Institute of Science is located in Media, Pennsylvania. And a question has come in from the Media Zero Waste Committee. Uh, several points actually they would like to bring up. So they've been going through something called the Gaia Zero Waste document. And they wanted to know if either of the presenters can address um, some of the issues that's been brought up there. One of them, one of the issues is that most bio-based plastic includes much fossil fuel-based plastic. Um, another point is bio-based plastic comes from agricultural land precluding food growing there. And another point is many compostable takeout containers have PFAs in them, which are highly toxic. So I don't know if either of you want to tackle any of those points. I'll take, I, I think only a part of it pertains to what, what I talked about. Um, the, the second part I think about um, bio-based plastics using food resources and the competition there. You know. um, there are other sources of the organics that can be used for bio-based plastics. We, we kind of hinted at it earlier with, with um, cellulosic material, um, lignin, which is oftentimes uh, kind of thought of as a, a waste. It's very hard to break down and things, but there are microbes that can convert that into biodegradable, I'm sorry, bioplastic type products. Um, and so you don't have to use food resources for that. You can use um, woody materials in a place like Pennsylvania where we are, um, lots of resources besides food. Um, you can use uh, bioenergy crops, things like, not, not food-based, but things like switchgrass grown in marginal uh, lands that, that wouldn't be used or shouldn't be used for food-based agricultural activities. So for example, riparian buffer zones on streams is an example where you wouldn't want to plant food products there, uh, but you can plant bioenergy crops there. Um, 
And, and the reason I asked my question to AJ earlier about if she worked on um, biorenewable plastics is that is also something groups are studying from municipal wastewaters. There are microbes that can store inside their cell um, biodegradable plastic precursors. They're called poly polyhydroxyalkanoates and they generate those from waste organics in municipal wastewater or agricultural wastewater. So, so not at all using food resources to make those products. The other, the first and the third questions, I, I don't know the answers to, maybe AJ does. Um, I guess if you could repeat the questions, that would be great too, so that I can at least give a more coherent answer. Yeah, absolutely. So the first one uh, is most bio-based plastic includes much fossil fuel-based plastic? Yes, the, uh, it does. <laughs> it does, but I think, I, I think um, thinking about um, plastics that are coming from fossil sources uh, is a bad thing. It's, it, it's not the right thinking that we should have. The right thinking that we should have is that can we reuse this material over and over and over again is a good question. If we can't completely degrade this particular plastic in the environment by itself, then can we take it and make something better with it? Or can we reuse it uh, by using different industrial processes is a good question. So if we have some sort of a plastic that we can break down uh, by a consumer, and then that gets taken out and then recirculate, uh, re if it's put back into circulation to be used again, that's not a net negative overall. I think that would be a really, really positive outcome, even though the plastic is not entirely biodegradable. I don't know if that's, you know, that's probably, like I said, uh, we do use a lot of fossil fuel force, uh, sources, but we still, um, we still need fossil fuel for a lot of things. The materials that we have around us, probably some of them do not have bio-based alternatives, unfortunately. A lot of the fossil fuel uh, products that we use can still be reused. We just need to figure out innovative ways of um, trying to reuse them. And then the, the final comment that came in, many compostable takeout containers have PFAs in them, which are highly toxic. I think you agreed with that. Yeah. I, I have a question too for AJ. D does anyone talk about plastics mining? You know, with all the plastics we have historically made, if 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 what you pre presented, we can do it in in feasible, economically feasible strategies. Um, I think. I think that's where things are going to go. Essentially, I think um, because there's not only so much energy stored in these plastic uh, materials, but there's also, again, a lot of potential for making virgin plastics uh, with them too. So I think plastic mining from landfills at some point is going to be yeah, okay. a, a very real thing. I want to just quickly jump. I'm going to share my screen for a sec to because uh, many times we always, we always like to say, well, what can the individual person do? So what what role do individuals have that are not part of these large research projects or research laboratories? And for those of you uh, that are not familiar with the Drawdown Eco Challenge, I encourage you to, to visit this website. Uh, Drawdown Eco Challenge is actually uh, a series of actions that you can take. And sometimes teams join up, DCIS has a team that's part of it. And when you look at their categories of solutions, their categories actually map right on to the different sectors that Project Drawdown has. So as we're discussing industry this evening, I can click on industry and there are numerous options here. And again, you don't have to sign up for an account on their website, but if you want to track points and make this a friendly competition with family members or friends or community groups, uh, but for example, just encouraging your company or organization to look at their carbon footprint, looking at the carbon footprint of your own house. These are, again, action items you can take. Uh, learning about carbon offsets, so educating ourselves into what's going on is also very important. Listening to podcasts about it, finding a climate-friendly supermarket that is local, 
Uh, clothing was also brought up earlier and learning about and practicing sustainable fashion is another one too. There is so much waste that is generated in the fashion industry. Uh, recycling, and, and this list goes on, recycled paper, going paperless. So I encourage you to check out the Drawdown Eco Challenge and thinking about how you can also play a part in getting us towards some of these solutions uh, to address what's going on with greenhouse gases and uh, our changing climate. So with that, I, and we're getting close to the end of our time here. Jay and AJ, do you have any last comments or any last closing thoughts you'd like to share with the group? Um, one thing that I have learned from my previous boss, he, he, did, he did this game uh, in front of the Congress. He encourages people to play the no plastic game, which is think about doing something in, in, throughout your day where you use absolutely no plastics at all. And that's a really, really difficult game if you think about it. Plastics are everywhere. And like I said, um, a life without plastics is at this point impossible, but there's always sustainable ways of using plastics. And uh, that's what we need to be doing moving forward. Not think about a world without plastic, but thinking about a world with plastic that is as sustainable as possible. My thought is pretty similar to what you just said, AJ. I, I noticed, Laura, as you were scrolling through, it had the five R's, practice the five R's. And we don't often think about the first one that was on that list, which was refuse, right? So um, bef before we always, we know the four R's, but there's a fifth one in their list and it's refuse. So it's, it's giving some uh, deliberate thought to your use of plastics, energy, carbon, water, all, all of those things are interconnected. So um, kind of challenging our, our typical thoughts of what we do and, and saying, I don't need to do this thing, you know, or I can choose to do this thing differently than I've always done. Thank you both for your time, your presentations this evening and this great discussion. I, I'm sure there's so many more questions we could ask. Uh, this again is being recorded this session. We will be posting it and sharing it at, as soon as we can. Uh, DCIS lectures will be taking a break now for the remainder of the summer. Look back in the fall. We will have a full slate of speakers going on again, monthly lectures that are open to the entire public. Uh, we will have a mix of in-person and virtual opportunities. Uh, we've been uh, excited to be able to share uh, the expertise, not just with everyone here in Media Pennsylvania, but uh, throughout the state. And actually, we've had people logging in from other states as well. So thank you both again for your time this evening. Thank and you. thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Have a wonderful night. Bye.